So if you have a Bible, you can pull out Psalm 130 in anticipation. Uh, so I think you'll be able to figure this one out. So when we looked at Psalms, though, we said, based on the uh, categories that Walter Brueggemann had defined, that there are Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and Psalms of new orientation. And so a Psalm of orientation uh, celebrate. These are the psalms that celebrate God as creator and as sustainer. They're psalms where everything is going well, where there is order and contentment. And to some degree, they can read a little bit more shallow because when everything is going well, people are happy to praise God, but it's all pretty, pretty easy. Uh, so then in contrast to that, a psalm of disorientation is when everything has fallen apart, when our world is broken, when we face peril or despair. So the psalms of disorientation are full of laments, even curses or cries for justice uh, that are found in the depths of human anger or grief or despair. Uh, these are the psalms that have the most complex language, and these are the psalms that are at times the most difficult to interpret because they at least some of them say some very aggressive and challenging things. So that's Psalms of orientation and then disorientation, but then out of disorientation, these Psalms often tell a narrative where they come to a place of new orientation. And so some of the new orientation Psalms cross over a little bit with the Psalms of orientation, uh, but a lot of them are very clearly kind of a flow out of disorientation into that new season. I just have a, a very short quote here from Brueggemann. He says, the other movement of human life is the surprising move from disorientation to a new orientation that is quite unlike the old status quo. This is not an automatic movement that can be presumed upon or predicted, nor is it a return to the old form, a return to normalcy as though nothing had happened. It is rather all things new. And when it happens, it is always a surprise, always a gift of graciousness, and always an experience that evokes gratitude. So there are our three categories. I'm now going to read for you Psalm 130. It's, it's only eight verses. It's a song of a sense. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to, the, to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Now, hopefully, you have been able to identify this. The first line kind of gives it away. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. This is a psalm of disorientation. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let, my, uh, let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Here the psalmist is crying from the depths, which is a common location for the psalmist. It's a very unfortunate reoccurring theme. This, the psalmist, uh, and the psalmist sometimes is David, sometimes it's uh, some other character. The psalms are written over a very long period of time and collated into a book later. They tell a particular narrative story. But we can talk about the psalmist, and the psalmist is often in strife and despair. In Psalm 69, we have a similar strife and despair. It says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. The, um, I think the psalmist is a teenager, given how melodramatic they are at times. <laughs> Whilst it is common... When reading the Psalms, so the Psalmist to take uh, on their prayer, uh, we, we often take on the prayer as our own. So when we hear out of the depths, when we hear, I'm up to my neck, um, I'm about to drown, I'm, I'm struggling in these depths, Lord. It, these are the Psalms that we can kind of pray out loud and identify. 
Now, I know that I live a life of incredible comfort and luxury and privilege, but the depths are still a place that we all experience. The depths of grief or disappointment, the depths of regret or shame, the depths of sickness, pain, frustration, disillusionment, the depths of anger and rage, and whether or not our depths are shaped by sorrow or disgust or by anger or some other heartfelt lament, it is not hard to see ourselves in the place of the psalmist. But Psalm 130 gives us more context than perhaps some of the others. If you, Lord, this is in uh, verse, which verse is this in? In verse 3. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? So the rhetorical question here makes it clear that the depths from which this particular psalmist is crying are not necessarily because of injustice or misfortune, but rather these are the depths of consequences for their own sinfulness. This psalmist deserves to be in their depths. This psalmist has allowed themselves to end up in this situation. They are not saying my enemies have come upon me. They're not saying that the floodwaters are up to my neck because of your rain, God, what are you doing? They are not saying that. They're saying, here I am in the depths. And of course, everyone would be in these depths if they were measured by your righteousness, God. Who could stand if you kept a record of sins? Now, you might be inclined to switch off at this point and think that all the depths that you experience are not your fault. Perhaps you are only struggling in your life because it is unfair and unjust. But I want to encourage you not to tune out so quickly because we are all implicated here. Who among us could stand? It's like the psalmist is saying, yes, I deserve to be in these depths, but so does everybody else. Because misery loves company. I may have got myself into this mess, but you got yourself into that mess as well. If you kept a record of sins, Lord, then who could stand? But, this is the magical but in the midst of this prayer. But with you there is forgiveness. So that we can, with reverence, serve you. See, the the psalm here changes with the pronouncement of God's forgiveness. But it does read a little bit like a bargaining quid pro quo. If you were to forgive, if you were to salvage, if you were to lift me from these depths, then of course, with reverence, I could serve you. Because Yahweh is so forgiving, so it's a claim on God's, on Yahweh's character and nature It's saying, because of who you are, Yahweh, you know, I got myself into this, but it's your nature to get me out of this. Then I can serve you with reverence. The word forgiveness here uh, is probably not quite right. Not quite right. This is the NIV translates it as forgiveness. I'm not sure why they've done that. But John Goldingay, who is a, uh, one of the, one of the scholars when it comes to this stuff nowadays. Uh, in fact, you know how I often read from the Bible for everybody? Uh, the New Testament of that was translated by N.T. Wright. The Old Testament of that was translated by this guy, John Goldingay. Uh, and he says this word forgiveness, forgiveness is more of a, uh, like when you are with family, with friends, with, with equals. This, the word here, though, is not saying, but with you, there is forgiveness, like we occasionally hurt each other, and now we need to forgive each other. The word is probably better shaped as, I need a pardon. O oh, gracious king, president, I need a pardon from my very, very guilty heart. I am clearly wrong. I'm not saying I didn't do it, but you are one who gives out pardons. To seek forgiveness places the offended and the offender on the same level, but to seek to a superior authority for a pardon, that is what is happening here. Now, the overwhelming religious sentiment is that we should fear God and hope that he forgives us. But in this particular passage, I said before, it's back to front. Because of God's pardon and forgiveness, we are empowered to revere him and serve him. It is because of his nature that we are able to revere and serve him. 
Brueggemann says this, one might have thought fearing Yahweh would be a ground for forgiveness, but this psalm scandalizes all our calculating notions of religion. The move comes the other way. The gift goes before the obedience. And I think that that is the, that is the truest understanding of God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his pardon to us is that all of that mercy and gift and pardon comes before the obedience, before our hearts can turn towards him. It is not out of terror that we submit ourselves to God. It is out of his grace and pardon that we recognize and we revere him. So with this statement, both petitioning and heralding God's mercy, uh, merciful character, the psalmist then begins with a more detailed petition. He says, I will wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I will put my hope. I will wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Now, if you have a very good memory, uh, earlier this year, I talked about Psalm 25. And I talked about how the word uh, wait is a better translation uh, in, and this is actually a slightly different word than uh, in Psalm 25, but it's the same sentiment. It's better to say wait than hope. Because when we hope for something, it's kind of maybe. But when we wait for something, it's certainty. The morning comes. The watchmen aren't sitting there on the wall thinking, geez, I hope that the sun comes up tomorrow. Maybe it won't happen. The watchmen know it will happen. They are waiting for it to happen. And the same is true here. The psalmist is waiting on the Lord. They are not hoping that it will happen. They're not hoping that by random chance that this particular moment, the Lord, no, no, no. Just as surely as the sun rises, the Lord is forgiving. Just as surely as the run, sun rises, the Lord offers a pardon. And in this word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. The dawn is coming. The coming of the Lord is not uncertain, but the psalmist must still wait for the appointed time. The psalm concludes with verse 7 and 8 as a petition now to all Israel. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is what the psalmist is waiting for. The psalmist says, I am guilty as charged, but I also know that you are merciful, that your character is good, and that when you come, not if you come, but when you come, because of your unfailing love, you will bring full redemption and you will redeem us and you will forgive us our sins. Now, this is a prayer that I can pray. Heavenly Father, I am completely guilty but you are merciful, but you forgive. I am grateful that you forgive. I'll await for you to come with your full redemption and forgive me for all my sins. See, just as the psalmist is waiting for the coming of the Lord, we too are in wait. We too await, not with just some random hope that maybe Jesus comes back, but we await with certainty that his kingdom is coming. Surely his kingdom is coming and surely he makes wrong things right. And surely all who are blind will see and all who are lame will walk and all who are dead in their sins will come to life in forgiveness. Not because of some great terror or fear of the Lord, but because of his unfailing love and his mercy and his pardon. Like the psalmist, we have more than an expectant hope. We are not simply crossing our fingers and saying a prayer. We wait with assured confidence that Jesus will return and finish the work that he started. The promises of his kingdom that we are hoping for are not in question. They are simply a future reality that we await. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great promises. I thank you that you of unfailing love and forgiveness. I pray that we would recognize our own plight in that depth, so that we would see our own complicity in the mess that we are in, and that we would seek and cry out and call upon your mercy, and that we would be um, just so richly blessed by your forgiveness. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we recognize our place and your great mercy, that we would be merciful to those around us 
that we would seek your kingdom and represent your kingdom everywhere that we are. In Jesus' name, amen.